boom, put a 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 boom, boom, A sad, B sad, what side are you on? Have you ever thought to yourself, man, I sure would like to make a podcast. I've got so much to say about blank. Well, if you haven't heard about Anchor, you really should. It is the easiest way to make a podcast and it's absolutely free. All right, I'm going to tell you why it's so easy. Okay, so with Anchor, there's creation tools that allows you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many others. And you can even make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. Trust me, I'm so excited about this. You can be too. Download the free Anchor app or go to Anchor FM to get started. Welcome back to the A-Side B-Side podcast. How's it going, Adam? I'm doing well, Brooke. How are you? Not bad. I can't complain. So real quick, I found this really interesting fact. So in episode 10, those guys from that home improvement murder, you talked about Eric Roberts. No. Yeah. Eric. No, not Eric Roberts. What's his name? Eric and Michael J. Fox. They both auditioned. Oh, yeah. Eric Stoltz. Marty Mc- yeah. Eric Stoltz. Eric Stoltz. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yes. Do you know that Ben Stiller also auditioned for the role of Marty McFly? I did not. That would have been awful. (laughs) That would have been real bad. (laughs) Like, and and Ben Stiller, like, I like him, but I, uh, I guess I can see it more than Eric Stoltz. But even then, I don't know that I want to see it. That would have been a very different movie. Well, and he was like, he didn't get his real break until like roughly ten years later. What was Ben Stiller? Was it was it Meet? No, but yeah, but was it Meet the Fockers? That uh Ben Stiller. So yeah. All right. I'm I'm using the internet because my brain is is not gonna support me on this one. He had his own sitcom at one point, uh, mm-hmm. before Meet the Fockers, uh, or Meet the Parents, which Meet the Fockers was like the sequel. Oh, the second one, yeah. Yeah. So uh the Ben Stiller show didn't happen like this was his sort of like attempt at like Seinfeld style and he didn't get that until 1992. So that's seven years after Back to the Future. And he was still really young. I remember that. that. Well, no one watched it. It was only 13 episodes long. Uh, But he was, so that was 1992. So 19, yeah, 1992. That was really his first thing. Like he had been in episodes of this and episodes of that all the way back to 86, but he had his Mm -hmm. own show. And so his show was beloved by people within the Hollywood community, but it was a complete and utter failure. So he was on Frasier for one episode. And then his first major role was Reality Bites with Ethan Hawke and went on a ride. And then I guess his first, major success was being the jerk in happy Gilmore. He was the orderly in the nursing uh, home that Adam Sandler's yeah. like, like mom hated. And then he was a cable guy. Yeah. I'm like, it took, it took a while before he became like a thing. Uh, zero effect. Which is funny because his was, parents were, you know, big deals. Yeah. Well, I think it was more that he was trying to, that they were trying to find the right role. I think, if if we go back to like when did Ben Stiller become a star? It was there mm-hmm. something about Mary. Yes, that's right. I think that I think that was like it. But like even then, I remember like recognizing the dude. You know, like he was here and there everywhere. But I think that was probably his first like actual success. Yeah. And I mean, Permanent Midnight was supposed to be his like Oscar winning role because Jerry Stahl was a actual person in Hollywood and it was talking about his deal with addiction uh, and he played him uh, but it didn't actually work out and then he was in Mystery Men which is still one of my favorite movies it's the Mystery movie that Man. got I don't remember that yeah so 1999 uh, it was sort of a superhero spoof movie mm-hmm. and uh, he played Mr. Furious and he would just get angry but then like it wouldn't actually do anything it was it was all about these like Act, these people that thought they were superheroes but didn't really have any 
powers. And then there was like the main superhero played by Greg Kinnear, who was, uh, what was his name? Like Mr. He basically was just standing in for Superman. And then the bad uh-huh. guy was, was uh, so you had uh, Captain Amazing played by Greg Kinnear and Captain of Frankenstein was the main bad guy played by Jeffrey Rush. And you also had like William H. Macy and Janine Garofalo, Cal Mitchell, Paul Rubens, Ben Stiller. Like they were all the like sort of like B level superheroes who after the the actual superhero got killed, they had to like kind of step in. But it was very much sort Mm -hmm. of a silly spoof version. I mean, William H. Macy's character was called the shoveler. He he had shovels. (laughs) <laughs> Kel, Kel Mitchell was okay. the invisible boy but he couldn't be invisible if anybody looked at him wow Paul Rubens okay. was the spleen and he just farted a lot so it was very uh, it was a very, a very Paul Rubens role yeah it was a very like weird over the top like silly version of superheroes and it didn't do as well as anyone expected uh, Jeanine Garofalo was the bowler and she had her father's head encased in a bowling ball and uh, he could she would throw it and he'd fly through the air and like hit people. When I say it out loud, it doesn't sound cool. But it was pretty cool. <laughs> all right. So all that to say that Ben Stiller actually auditioned for the role of Marty McFly. If you didn't hear that episode about Eric Stoltz and how he initially or actually Michael J. Fox. Well, listen to the episode because yeah. Eric Stoltz was almost Marty McFly and Michael J. Fox. And all of that is in episode 10. So you can check that out. Um, and uh, I, Michael J. Fox has a new autobiography coming out in November called Living for the Future, which talks about both his acting career and his experience over the last 15 years dealing with uh, Parkinson's. So it is not out in stores yet, but you can pre-order it on Amazon, and I already have, and it will be in my mailbox if Amazon can figure out where I live on the day it's released, which is, I think, November 17th. So if you're into Back to the Future, listen to the episode, but also uh, maybe check out that book. Okay. Oh, I finished Lovecraft, the final, the season. I don't know if it's the season or series because they haven't confirmed a season two. I'm hoping that there's a season two, but that last episode was insanely good. Oh, Mm. man. And then the vow. Whoa. Like, and apparently uh, if you have watched the vow, you should click on over to stars because one of the people in the organization that they were trying to get out there is another related show on stars about that oh nice so i'm so gonna like check a, that like out yeah it just kind of a spinoff type of deal uh i wouldn't say spinoff but they're related because it's okay. two different networks so oh that's fair I don't, that probably don't play right play nice <laughs> Shout outs. Awesome. Thank you for listening. If you are, I'll, I'll let you handle if you want to say anything about Minnesota. There's some like places in New York that I, I've never even heard of Honey Oy Falls, but thank you and Honey Oy Falls, New York for listening. And like in Poughkeepsie uh, in California in Pleasanton and Clovis in Virginia, Ashburn and Chantilly. And you guys are rocking. Thank you so much. Also over in Arizona, Peoria, I always thought it was Peoria, Illinois, but I guess there's a Peoria, Arizona as well. Doesn't shock me. I mean, like, and that, there are like 37 Springfields. That's true. That's true. Yeah. In Hawaii, I hope I'm saying this right. And if I don't say it right, please correct me. It's uh, Wailuku, 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 Hawaii. I just really wanted an excuse to try to say Wailuku, Hawaii. <laughs> we, we like you a lot <laughs> so cool. for listening. That's all. <laughs> It sounds so cool. Also, in Oklahoma, Ada, Oklahoma, checking in. Thank you. And Ada, you're going to actually be in the B-side today. Ooh. Oh. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, I, what up? so this is the danger of the internet and having data. Because you start to see all the, the information. I'm like, oh, my gosh. We have people in two of the – so we got 50 states, right? And so, like, continental mm-hmm. U.S., that's – for me, that's where I've always tried to like visit all the states, but I've never thought I was going to get to all 50. But my voice evidently has gotten to both Hawaii and Alaska in Fort Wainwright, which so we've we've hit two of the non-continental United States, which is kind of amazing to me. I didn't think yeah. I would ever get there. I didn't even think my voice would get there. I'm actually so I tried to look at this entire list today because 
Brooke does all of the legwork and she does all of the details. And she's like, hey, look at all these places that people have listened to our podcast. And I was like, holy crap, this is great. Have we hit all of the 50 states? And we're really close. We are really Which, close. Which, I mean, it's exciting. that's pretty cool. Uh, so, of course, in Minnesota, we've got a bunch of places that I'm familiar with, like your St. Paul, Minneapolis, the Twin Cities, uh, Maple Grove, which is a bedroom community, and then two harbors, which is on the, an hour and a half north, maybe two hours north. I'm not good with distances, but that's pretty cool. Um, then there's a city I've never heard of, Floodwood. I've lived here. I was, I was going to ask you about I that. I mean, it sounds like a city from Skyrim. Floodwood. It's like where the flood yeah. happened and there's a, there's some trees and there's also like a magician that you have to fight. Uh, I've never even heard of that city. So that's pretty exciting to learn that there are places I have not heard before. Also, we've got the Bronx, which yes. I kind of love that the Bronx just shows up as the Bronx. Like Brooklyn gets Brooklyn, <laughs> but the Bronx gets a the that's impressive. Like we're we're in it's the boogie down. We're in the Bronx. Look at places in Tennessee. Like I was just talking today with a friend of mine. We were trying to figure out he was in a a trivia battle, and they were like, "What state has a city that is more known for music than the capital?" And he's like, "Is it Tennessee?" And I'm like, "No, I'm pretty sure Nashville is the capital. I mean, Memphis is pretty." pretty great but like it's i don't know if it's gonna be more known so we settled on new orleans and baton rouge because new orleans is the home of jazz but i was like holy crap and then i looked at this list and we've got both nashville and memphis on the list uh there are definitely many members of my extended family in wisconsin trying to figure out what the heck i'm doing with my life and i love that uh because wisconsin rapids nakusa superior madison waukesha are all on there and i see you family and I'm totally planning on getting a real job someday. So don't tell my parents. Yeah. Uh, Indiana has a Syracuse, which again, like you said, Peoria, Illinois. But we have Peoria in Arizona. Syracuse is in Indiana, evidently. I did not know that. There's also a Georgetown, Indiana. So if your kid is saying he's going to Georgetown University, just make sure which state it's in. Right. <laughs> uh, Arkansas, All there's right. a little rock. Uh, so I'm just going to say hi to my brother and sister in law and uh, their best friends and their families, uh, the Brules. So I'm assuming that's you. If not, other people in Little Rock, I love you also as much. Um, since you have named every city now, <laughs> we have this, the document you send me is four pages long. I didn't, I didn't even get the chance to say and You didn't have to name everything. Yeah, but I mean, like, <laughs> it's pretty exciting that these people are all over the place listening to us. So uh, my ego grew three sizes today. Well, I'm never sending you another list again. <laughs> <laughs> We're in Hartford, Connecticut, which love... means that we might be listened to by people who run ESPN. Just saying. I have family in Hartford, Connecticut that work for ESPN, so maybe it's them. Hi, family. My family also. We do sports. We we don't we don't we we, we, we don't we totally could <laughs> no 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 we can't <laughs> uh, really cool I think Tonka Tonka Han wait Tonkhonic Tonkhonic Pennsylvania I cannot get the names right and I am so sorry but I think it's a cool name so there you go and then there's like places like Philippines mm -hmm. uh, Calabar Calabarzon. In the Philippines, there's Leinster, Ireland. What's up? Oh man, Queensland. We had that story about crazy Kathy in Queensland. What's up, Queensland? So anyway, thank you. Also, there, okay, we have there's we have a Nottingham in Maryland. I don't know if they have a forest, mm -hmm. but be aware of a guy in a green hat if they do. Oh gosh. All right. We are gonna jump into the B side here in just a second. All right, so now last week we did a little switchery, Rui thing where we kind of combined both sides. It would have been uh, Adam starting, so it's back to the B side. I'm sure you've heard stories of Matthew Shepard, Tina Brandon. Um, here's the thing. These are just a few of the numerous beautiful lives that have been destroyed and amazing souls that have been taken from us simply because... Someone either is confusing themselves or they don't agree with the way that someone else loves or who they love. 
nearly one in five hate crimes are motivated by an anti LGBTQ bias. According to FBI statistics, of the 7,120 hate crime incidents that were reported in 2008, more than 1,300 or nearly 19% stemmed from an anti LGBTQ bias. Again, that's reported cases. You've got to imagine how many cases go unreported. Also, according to the FBI hate crime statistics, nearly of the nearly 1,200 incidents targeted at people due to their sexual orientation, the majority targeted gay men, which is roughly 60%. And this is one of those stories. Now, before I get into the story, I have to say it's graphic. I have to say the language used is horrific and disgusting, and it does not represent the views of A Side B Side podcast. And I struggled with whether or not to use the full language. And I asked several people their opinion, and everyone said yes, because if you really want to get the truth behind the story, you have to give the full story. And it's important to be uncomfortable sometimes. So last week we had a story that was local to Bowling Green. This is a story that I remember from my time in the service on a base where I was stationed and it happened during my time there. I didn't know the soldier, but his, his death, I mean, it shocked not just the entire post, but the entire community. And uh, it's one that over the years I've, I've thought back over again and again and again because of how disturbing and I mean all crime is unnecessary but it's just it's like this was so it was so pointless I just I don't know you know you hear stories and they sit with you and this is one that for years since it happened has has always been in my mind this is the story of private first class Barry Winchell Barry Lauren Winchell was born on August 31st of 1977 in Kansas City Missouri Barry was a good kid, but he didn't always have it easy. When he was four, his mom packed him and his two older brothers up and she left her husband. The single mom of three didn't have much more than a car and they ended up living in their car for a short period of time. In school, Barry struggled quite a bit. He didn't even learn his alphabet or how to read until he was eight years old in third grade. When he was old enough, he decided school was not his deal and he dropped out. But in all other respects, Barry was your typical all-American kid whose life, besides academically, improved greatly when his mom remarried. His youth was filled with commonplace activities like hub and Boy Scouts and piano lessons and even Rocket Club. Of course, as Barry got older, he moved on from piano lessons to bass guitar and heavy metal, and he even played in a band. And, you know, as what tends to happen when you're lo- you're young yeah you fall in love right mm-hmm. that young puppy love and that happened to Barry Barry went to prom you know he had a prom date and the girl that he went to prom with kind of thought he was going to marry one day well i mean that's, so after that's dropping what we're out, told right yeah sometimes sometimes high school sweethearts yeah. it's a thing so after dropping out of school Barry wanted to do something to better himself so he decided to be all that he could be that was the slogan back in the day be all that you can be and he joined the army in 1997 Barry's stepfather Wally Cuddles said that before he enlisted he told me he'd seen all the movies and that he knew all about the army I told him it's not going to be like the movies I told him somebody is going to chew you out and you're going to have to be able to take it you're going to have to stand up and be a man he said I can do that And I understand completely Barry's feeling because I remember when I joined, you're like, I can do this. And people are like, no, you really, I don't think you do. And you're like, I got this. And you feel so good when you do it. So uh, the military seemed to have the desired effect on Barry as his parents noticed this huge transformation. He did his basic training at Fort Benning, which is in Georgia. And while he was there, he did what most people do. He wrote home. Telling, telling stories about your time in basic training. And of course, you're looking for letters back. You know, that was always the big thing, mail call. It's like, did I get mail? I mean, like if you got mail, it was like you were the stuff. And uh, so Barry was always sending letters back and forth and they were happy and they were lighthearted and they were joke filled. And he just was really having a good time. He thrived in the military. 
of course he graduates basic and you know he's just trying to be the best soldier that he can he even became uh an expert marksman he was the best in his company and he of course that's going to get you heaps of praise from your mm-hmm. superior officers one of his his captains even encouraged him to further his education and career by becoming a helicopter pilot so in may of 1998 barry was stationed at fort campbell mm-hmm. in kentucky if you've never been to Fort Campbell or if you don't know about it, it actually sits mm-hmm. on two states. The state line runs down the middle of Fort Campbell. But when it was built, the post office was put on the Kentucky side. So it's Fort Campbell, Kentucky. And this is uh, he was assigned to you the. You were stationed? Mm hmm. Yeah, that's where I was stationed. And um, Barry, we were like, we weren't, he was in an infantry unit. I was not, I was in a, a field hospital unit. Barry was assigned to the second battalion, 502nd infantry of the 101st air assault. And, uh, whoa. and, uh, as with many soldiers, I saw it happen a few times. Barry got a dear John letter from his high school sweetheart. So it happened a lot in basic, you know, these guys come in, they got their girlfriends and they're going to get married when they graduate. And then, you know, halfway through basic, they get this letter where the girl's like, um, I'm sorry, you're too far away. I can't handle yeah. it. You know, it happens better then than, you know, months later where they end up getting married and it doesn't work out, you know, I mean, yeah, it sucks, thought, but, but yeah, you, you drive on, you know, so, um, very like young soldiers without families, you know, wife, kids lived in the barracks. You live on post. If you don't have a family, you live on post, period, point blank. Of course, if you live in the barracks, you have a roommate. And that roommate was specialist Justin Fisher. So Justin was described as a hellion. He liked to drink. He liked to fight. He passed out, woke up, and told a good story, and then did it all over again. A Rolling Stone article said that one time, Justin let a friend borrow clothing before a night out in Nashville. Now, Nashville is only about 45 minutes from Fort Campbell, depending on where you're going. But if you're going downtown to the clubs, which is what most, you know, students at um, the college and what the soldiers do, uh, it's only about a 45 minute drive. So it's a frequent weekend. So Justin let a friend borrow clothing before a night out. And on the way home, Justin made this friend take off the clothing that he had borrowed and he made him drive back home in his underwear. That's weird. Of, yeah. But I think he just yeah. liked the control, the power. I've got this Those are control my over you. Back. A former room, right. A former roommate and another fellow soldier, Private Bill Marsh, said, hanging around Fisher, you might get yourself in trouble or you might get in trouble yourself, but it was usually worth it. You're going to have a good time. So he was a troublemaker, but, you know, in a unit full of dudes, he was... He was the dude to hang out with. Everybody kind of, yeah, he got in trouble, but it was always fun for them. (sighs) Justin's rebel hellion persona was a complete shift from the anxious youngster that he had been with an emotionally abusive father who berated him at every turn. He had a physically abusive stepfather. Justin was from Lincoln, Nebraska, and he worked menial jobs until he joined the military in 1997. See, Justin ended up having a son, and he wanted to be able to provide for him. In May of 1999, shortly after the two were assigned as roommates in the barracks, now you've got Mm -hmm. the hellion, and you've got the gung-ho trying to be the best soldier I can be. Not really compatible personalities, you know? Uh, Some people describe their relationship as love-hate. They just couldn't see eye to eye. And that relationship ended up in a fight one time and they both got reprimanded. It, it started as an argument fueled with alcohol, of course, over who was going to clean the room. Apparently, Barry was a very clean person, Justin not so much. And it ended up with Justin sitting on Barry's chest, like pummeling him in the face. And someone got hit in the head with a metal dustpan and this is blood and stitches. And yeah. It was a whole mess. But... Despite this, the two remained roommates. Captain Rouse, their uh, company commander, asked them if they wanted to change roommates. And they both said, nah, we just had a spat. We like each other. So another thing about Justin, aside from being like 
the hellion rebel he was also obsessed with having the tough guy persona he idolized tony montana yeah you know from scarface little friend and mr and mr blonde from that's disturbing yeah so in july of 1999 justin was at home on leave and he caught wind of apparently somebody harassing his younger sister and so he went out and bought a Louisville Slugger baseball bat because he planned to handle this dude. He planned to take care of business. He never ended up using the bat, but he he couldn't resist the urge to get revenge on people he felt needed it. And again, this is his re- reasoning, his rationale. So it could be. And he was anything. in Kentucky. Louisville Slugger is from Louisville, Kentucky. I mean, sort of on point with his location as well. Well, he was at home oh, in Nebraska. Well, then so. it was just a weird thing. They're good bats. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, he was at home on leave in Nebraska. So ever the rebel with that I don't give mm-hmm. up attitude, Justin ventured into Nashville. And he came back again. He liked to drink. He liked to fight. He liked to tell stories. So he came back to post and he's telling the guys this story about, you know, his night out and how much he had fun how, or how much fun he had. And he's telling them about this club that he visited. And he's talking about this amazing girl that he saw performing on the stage and she was lip syncing to Madonna. Yeah. It was a gay club. So he had had so much fun that Saturday night that he made Barry and some other guys go back to Nashville to go to that club. That club was called Connection. Connection, it's it's no longer in operation. It closed its doors in 2005. It was a massive warehouse. It was huge. It had showrooms for the drag shows. It had, you know, with these huge stages for the performances, there's dance floors and there was a gift shop and there was a country Western bar. I mean, it was enormous. I mean, it was in a warehouse, literally. And I mean, it was a popular spot for gay, straight. I mean, everybody went to Connection. It was just, you know, single girls like to go because they can go dancing and they want and, you know, see the drag shows. Of course, the guys are going to go because they're like, mm-hmm. oh, the girls are here. And then it, and it was a gay club. So, of course, it had the gay population. I mean, everybody went to Connection. It was a good time. So the woman that had caught Justin's attention and just completely captivated him was 28 year old Calpurnia Adams. Initially, Calpurnia was her stage name, it has since become her name. Calpurnia took her name mm-hmm. from Julius Caesar's wife. It's spelled differently, but that's where she got Calpurnia and Adams from the Adams family. Calpurnia herself had actually served in the Navy as a medic and served in the Gulf War. She was in the Navy for four years. And during her last year in the military, she came out as a transgender woman. I don't know Calpurnia's previous name. It doesn't matter. Right. It's irrelevant to the story. It doesn't matter anymore. What does matter and what is relevant to this story is a pattern that Calpurnia and several other performers have noticed and have become very familiar with, not just as drag performers, but as gay men, civilian in the military. It's just a pattern that, like I said, Calpurnia has noticed and several other performers as well. A boy enlists in the military with the belief that it's going to make him a man. And then, you know, one night on the, on the town, he gets drunk in an unfamiliar city, surrounded by loud, thumping, bassy music and beautiful people, like the most beautiful people he's ever seen. And it just like stirs something deep in him. And then he realizes that he's been captivated by a man and it mm-hmm. confuses him and some don't know how to deal with that. So it was Sunday night when Barry first met Calpurnia and she didn't really notice him at first because of Justin and his very rambunctious, loud personality. And he was doing everything he could to get her attention. Calpurnia said that Barry looked at me kind of like boys look at strippers. His eyes were darting all around and he's, he's not looking me in the eye. And she said, I think he found me attractive, but was unnerved the next weekend barry and justin and all the boys went to nashville again and she said and afterwards we went to an after hours club another performer from connection kimmy satin said that now again remember i'm using language i'm using actual full quotes i am not changing anything 
Kimmy, Kimmy said they come on Friday, Saturday nights, these little jarhead freaks from Fort Campbell who want a blow job with a drag queen. You see a dozen every night and they will say they're straight. They seem to think that being with me doesn't make them gay. They can say in their mind, I didn't know it was a man till we finished or something fucked up like that. Kimmy said in an interview that uh, while she and Justin engaged in heavy petting, it never went beyond that. She said she saw Justin three or four times and it was while he was always in the company of other soldiers. She said that while Justin was, wasn't particularly good looking, he was memorable because of his big personality. His Not persona. a metaphor. No. When Barry and Calpurnia met, she had been taking hormones for two years and, and Barry had absolutely no problem treating her like a lady should be treated. She said he always was treating me like a lady, bringing me jewelry and things. Barry was the type of man who could undo the jelly jar if it was stuck, undo the jelly if it was stuck. He was one of the only people in his circle that had his own car and it had leather seats <laughs> and it rode real smooth. I that, That's such a like, that's such a, when you're infatuated with someone, you find like the little things about them, like, he opened the jelly for me and he had a nice car. I just, that's just such a, you it, know, I'm totally. It feels like a do up. That's just how, that's how that sounds. Right. <laughs> like, like it, it, it's just very do up yeah. love. We're like, just, I'm so infatuated. Like yes. he could open the jelly jar. His car rides smooth. And his name was Bill. Like, okay. Like we need a little bit more right. here. <laughs> Tina. Right. Do up, do up. Do yeah, it does. It really jar. Jenny John. I was going to be a backup singer. That was that was my goal. It's not a thing anymore. Okay. <laughs> so Kimmy and Justin, they had a little passing fling, a fat, you know, a fascination with each other. But Calpurnia and Barry really hit it off. And within a few weeks, they were spending lots of free time together. Barry had stopped drinking with the boys in the barracks. And he was keeping Calpurnia company. On the weekends, he would wait in her dressing room while she performed. And they would go on dates, like, to the movies. And they would hold hands. You know, it was very so he, sweet. he was there as support, Sometimes not as Calpurnia just, like, would someone even... who's watching the show. That's a big difference. Yes. I mean, he's yeah. just in the back in her dressing room waiting. Just waiting for her to get off the stage. I mean, it's so cute. So... Calpurnia would even come back to post with Barry sometimes, and the two would say their goodbyes at the gate outside of the post so no one would mm. witness them. But as cute and as happy as it all sounds, they, they just don't have a happy ending. Justin Fisher's, uh, Justin Fisher's bullying and intimidation, it actually started the very first night they all went out to Nashville. That night, Justin kept the guys waiting while he and Kimmy messed around and he finally came back and he's bragging he's bragging about how he hooked up with that chick Kimmy and then on the car ride back to Fort Campbell now remember what I said he's bragging about hooking up with the ch that mm -hmm. chick Kimmy okay so on the car ride back to Fort Campbell Justin starts hitting and smacking Barry and he's messing with him so bad that he even ends up tearing his shirt and he announces to the whole car that he wanted to quote kick Wenchel's ass for a long time. His aggravations continued and he continued pestering Barry until he finally fell asleep in the back seat. The very next day, for who knows what reason, maybe his own guilty conscious confession, he doth protest mm -hmm. too much, methinks. So Justin goes to a sergeant in the unit and he tells the sergeant that a member of the unit, but he's not going to name any names, had knowingly and willfully engaged in sexual intercourse with a man. It's an infantry unit, which means it's an right. all male unit. And is it like I should know th at that point? Well, that's why I say I think it was maybe his guilty, con like quote unquote, right. guilty conscience. Now, this is a time during the don't ask, don't right. tell this was policy. Early it was a legal 2000s, policy. Right? In 90, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. 99, so 99. before that. 99. So. It was a legal policy that stated that homosexuality was incompatible with military service and that anyone who engaged in homosexual acts or stated that they were homosexual or bisexual were to be discharged. So the don't ask provision mandated that the military or appointed officials could not ask or require members to reveal their sexual orientation. The don't tell stated that a member could be discharged 
for claiming to be homosexual or bisexual or making a statement indicating conduct towards or intent towards engaging in homosexual activities. This policy was a mess. It caused lots of issues. Confusing. And just, it um, should be noted that also, yeah, yeah, it ended under the Obama administration. Which unfortunately so, was Justin what, eight, nine years sergeant, after this. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So Justin tells the sergeant that he knows of a member of the unit that's engaged in sex with a man. But then he tells other members of the unit different stories. Like he, one story he had, he says that he drops Barry off at a gay bar and came back to discover him engaged in oral sex with a man. Another person he tells that he comes back to the barracks to discover Barry in the middle of oral sex with a woman. And then when the view is no longer obscured, he realizes it's not a woman at all. It's a man. None of these stories were ever verified. It's just Justin trying his best to put that shadow on to Barry and I guess get him kicked out. That well, seems to be avoid, what the goal was. Avoid it. Because if, at, like he's trying to distract from him. Right. But again, during the don't ask, don't tell, if if a member of the military was seen to be a homosexual, he would be discharged. So it seemed like Justin was just taking lots of pleasure in antagonizing and trying to embarrass Barry. One time in front of a group of fellow soldiers, he asked Barry, what's it like to suck cock? So specialist Edgar Rosa recalled that Justin, he just loved ruffling Barry's feathers. Again, this language is not acceptable it's not okay and it does not align with the views of this podcast Sorry, but man. i have to say it for the story edgar rosa said that justin liked to to call barry things he'd say he'd like to call him a dumb fuck a a queer fuck a fucking faggot he would taunt barry trying to get him to hit him he'd scream in his face and he'd yell at him and he'd degrade him but barry never broke so initially when the taunting started One of the soldiers that was at the outing the first time in Nashville, Philip, specialist Philip Ruiz, he said to Justin, dude, you kissed a guy. Now, you remember Justin came running out yelling and bragging, I made out with that chick. Everybody knew that Kimmy was a professional drag performer. So, of course, Justin is like, what? That never happened. I don't remember that. I was drunk. I don't know what you're talking about. My opinion, I'm just going to give you my opinion, is that Justin either had feelings for Calpurnia or he had feelings for Barry and he didn't know how to deal with that. I mean, we've seen this time and time again when people don't know how to deal with what they're feeling. They take it out on other people. And it's usually the target of their affection. Also, he clearly had some attraction to Kimmy. And then is trying to walk that back because he's denying it happened. So one particular incident that could maybe give some insight into that. In May, sometime in May of 1999, Barry told Calpurnia that he was awakened by Justin fondling him, like rubbing him, rubbing his body, rubbing his feet. And he he said, Calpurnia said, he, he told me, he jumped up and said, what the hell are you doing? And Justin said, oh, I'm just drunk. And Barry said, well, get off. And and Barry told Calpurnia that the incident yeah, freaked him out. That uh, that would freak mm-hmm. anyone out. That's not okay. Yeah. Just don't be touching on me and I'm asleep. I'm yeah. sleeping, dude. Leave me alone. So um, Justin later does admit during a hearing that he was afraid of his manhood. And Dr. Keith Caruso, a forensic psychiatrist, said that Justin was sexually confused and curious he had even secretly been wearing women's underwear and lingerie since the age of 14. Okay. So again, he's got these feelings. He doesn't know how to handle them. He takes out his feelings yeah. in aggression. So soon Justin's deriding and name calling was witnessed by the entirety of the Delta company. All 95 men, platoon Sergeant Michael Kleifkin said they called him faggot. I would say on a daily basis. In the midst of all of Justin's anti-gay sentiment, in stumbles private Calvin Glover. Calvin had only been in the Army for about eight months and at Fort Campbell since April. Calvin at the time had never really been involved 
uh, and the hatefulness geared toward Barry from Justin. Um, but obviously, if we're talking about yeah. him, some things are going to change. Calvin's parents were hopeful because they felt that the military would be good for him because it would pro- provide him revision and structure. Calvin, on the other hand, saw this as a way into the world. Like a lot of people, when you go in the military, you're like, I'm going to get to travel and see the world. Um, he grew up in Oklahoma. And he lived between two homes, his mother's home in Sulphur and his dad's home in Ada. Calvin had a very troubled youth from drinking to drugs. And he was in and out of youth homes for troubled kids in Ada. And just like in the civilian world, Calvin really had trouble making friends in the military. He just couldn't find where he fit in. So he gained, he gained a a, Making friends is hard. Hmm? It's not as easy as people say. So he gained a reputation as a guy who tried too hard. Justin was the kind of guy that Calvin wanted to be. So he began to emulate him, like his storytelling style, Mm. his machismo, and even his homophobic rhetoric, which is in complete contrast to the insecure young man that found acceptance and security among gay teens, among the gay teen population during his stays at the youth shelters in Ada. So Barry who'd been spending most of his free time in Nashville, decided over the 4th of July weekend in 1999 that he was going to stay on post. He wanted to save money because his parents were coming in for a visit. And in August, he was going to turn 22. Barry also wanted to study for an award that he'd been nominated for, the Delta Company Soldier of the Month. Plus, Barry had really gotten some good news. He found out that he'd been accepted into warrant officer school, which would allow him to go on and become a pilot. Now, the following is actually from court documents. I am reading it from the document itself. It's the U.S. versus Fisher. About midnight on July 3rd, 1999, Justin Fisher, Private Kelvin Glover, PFC or Private First Class author Arthur Hoffman and Private First Class Barry Winchell were relaxing in front of their barracks. Private Glover was telling stories about how he used to take drugs, deal drugs, and rob banks before he came into the military. All were drinking beer except for PFC Hoffman. Eventually, PFC Winchell told Private Glover to, quote, take his drunk cherry ass to bed. Humiliated by this put down, Private Glover tried to confront PFC Winchell, indicating he wanted to fight. And he tried several times to knock the beer out of PFC Winchell's hands. PFC Winchell hit Private Glover three or four times in the face. He threw him to the ground and easily subdued him. Private Glover did not succeed in landing any blows on PFC Winchell. The staff duty NCO, or non-commissioned officer, walked by and PFC Hoffman and Specialist Fisher separated the two combatants. PFC Winchell and Private Glover shook hands in front of the staff duty NCO to show that the fight was over. PFC Winchell, who was Barry... I know it's a lot of PFCs and privates and specialists. So PFC Winchell said repeatedly to Private Glover, it's cool, right? Private Glover responded, no, it's not cool. It ain't over. I will fucking kill you. We ain't through. After the fight, Private Glover said to Specialist Fisher and Specialist, uh, excuse me, and uh, PFC Hoffman, I won't let a faggot kick my ass. Specialist Fisher, PFC Hoffman, and Private Glover were all aware of a rumor that PFC Winchell was gay. The following day, which would have been the fourth, Specialist Fisher repeatedly taunted Private Glover about losing a fistfight to a, quote, faggot. He said, how does your face feel? How did it feel to get your ass kicked by a faggot? That night, Specialist Fisher gave the underage Private Glover beer and continued to bait him while the two drank in Private Glover's room. Sometime after 1.15 a.m., the fifth, Specialist Fisher and Private Glover left Private Glover's room and walked into Specialist Fisher's room, passing by PFC Wenchel, who was sleeping on a cot located outside the doorway to the room shared by PFC Wenchel and Specialist Fisher. So apparently Barry that night was on duty. He was watching the company Mm -hmm. mascot, which is a dog. um, And Justin didn't like the dog and he wouldn't let it in the room. So he was sleeping outside of the room on a cot with the company mascot. So after arriving at Special, Specialist Fisher's room, Fisher turned on his compact disc player and played the soundtrack from Psycho. Private Glover picked up Specialist Fisher's wooden baseball bat, if you remember, mm-hmm, and began making chopping motions while mumbling to himself. Private Glover had a wide-eyed, psychotic look on his face, and Specialist Fisher heard him repeatedly mumble the word, faggot. 
Private Glover continued walking around and swinging the bat for about 10 minutes and then told Specialist Fisher he wanted to, quote, fuck up PFC Winchell. Specialist Fisher told Private Glover to, quote, go for it. Private Glover left the room and mortally wounded PFC Winchell by hitting him in the head and the neck multiple times with the baseball bat as he lay on his cot. Private Glover then returned to his room, announced that he had, quote, whooped his ass and secured Specialist Fisher's assistance in washing the blood off the bat. Specialist Fisher subsequently pretended not to know what happened and tried to cover up the true course of events. In the course of the investigation, Specialist Fisher made several written statements under oath to the U.S. Army Criminal Investigation Command. Specialist Fisher was charged with false swearing in regard to these statements. And we'll get to the rest of that later. But so um, at 3 a.m., the fire alarms blared in the barracks. And of course, soldiers flee from their rooms. And that's when they learn of Barry's injuries. Justin ran into a room downstairs, a room that was shared by Private First Class Jonathan Joyce and Nikita Sarnaroff, yelling, Winchell's dying, acting as if he had found him there that way. So PFC Joyce goes upstairs and he sees Winchell on the cot, blood everywhere. He runs back downstairs and he tries to call 911. He calls several times and he can't get through. What he doesn't realize is that 911 doesn't work on Barrick's phone. Really? So PFC Joyce. Uh, that's weird, doesn't. but okay. It might now. It, it might yeah, now, fair, fair, but fair. then it didn't. I, re- I remember them. I, I remember that it didn't. And I can't, I can't exactly remember why, but it didn't. Those phones were weird. You had oh, yeah. to and dial this like and dial that. At some to get point, out. somebody said yeah, natural, was... national security. So then that was all okay. So PFC Joyce runs outside and he finds a payphone. He calls 911 while the other soldiers are inside attending to Barry. And of course, uh, Glover is gone and Fisher is pretending he has no idea what has happened and he's pretending to be concerned. And oh my gosh, what's happening? Barry was taken to Vanderbilt Medical Center where he died due to the massive head injuries. Investigators actually found Glover in his room and they found the bloodstained shirt and there were smears on his doorframe. While in custody, a PFC Ryan Futch was in charge of guarding Calvin and he said he overheard Calvin and another prisoner, Private Kenneth Buckler, exchanging hateful talk about blacks and homosexuals. PFC Futch also said that Calvin admitted to him that he beat Barry with the bat. Justin wasn't actually charged until July 18th. 10 days after his initial interview where he lied and 13 days after the murder, Justin was charged with murder being an accessory after the fact, three counts of false swearing, two counts of obstruction of justice and one count of giving alcohol to a minor, all in violation of the UCMJ, the United Code of Military Justice. Excuse me. I said United. I meant uniform, uniform code of military justice. He was sentenced by a military judge to a dishonorable discharge, confinement for 14 years, forfeiture of all pay and allowances, and a reduction to the lowest enlisted grade of E1. Now, a specialist is E4. I don't know if Justin went in as an E1 and worked his way up to E4, or sometimes with some schooling and some background, you can go in a little bit higher or you can test higher. I'm guessing he probably you know, worked from an E1 up to an E4, which takes time. So he, he, he was busted rank basically. And good. I, if he could have been an E negative five, you know, I would have said given that, but in a pretrial plea agreement to testify against Calvin, his sentence was reduced to a term of 150 months, which is 12 and a half years, but everything else remained the same. Calvin Glover, on December 9th, 1999, was convicted of premeditated murder for the beating death of Barry Winchell. He's serving a life sentence. He had the possibility, with the possibility of parole. I know he has not received parole. He is still serving his sentence. Both Justin and Calvin served their sentences at the U.S. Disciplinary Barracks at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. In August of 2006, Justin Fisher was released to a halfway house, and he was released from custody in October of 2006. In 2003, there was a movie called Soldier's Girl that stars Troy Garrity and Lee Pace. 
And it's the story based on Barry and Calpurnia's relationship and Barry's tragic death. The film received a Peabody Award and numerous Emmy and Golden Globe nominations. Calpurnia, who is now an author, an actress, musician, and an activist for transgender rights and issues, does not like talking about the events unless you're, you know, a close friend or family member. Um, She writes on her website, which is calpurnia.com. If you happen to read this and then ever chance to meet me in person, I'll take this moment to ask you to please consider the situation and moment before bringing up Barry's murder. At events related to activism or somehow relating to the film, or if we are close personal friends, I understand and expect it to come up at some point. Sometimes I need to talk about it myself, but still at light parties, clubs, and social events, sometimes people I've met bring up his murder as a light conversational topic, either directly or through mentioning the movie, and then asking me questions about the real life experience. I don't think p- these people realize Soldier's Girl was not just a movie. It was a portrayal of a real personal painful event, which is not something I like to discuss lightly over dinner in a shopping mall or at a party. If you happen to have brought it up to me in person in a lighthearted manner before reading this page, don't feel bad or worry about it. Many people were touched by the film and wanted to share that with me. So I understand. But now it has been almost 10 years at the time that this was written. It's over 20 now. If I can head off some awkward moments, I would like to do so. Thank you. Sadly, Calpurnia learned about Barry's attack on the news. She said, when I heard what happened, I thought, oh God, they've killed him because of me. After Barry's death, his parents, Wally and Patricia Cuddles, became huge advocates in ending the don't ask, don't tell policy. And she was able to see the policy reversed before her death on November 14 of 2006. She was only 67 years old. She died from kidney and liver failure after being treated for cancer. Before her death, Patricia and Wally sued the army for wrongful death because the officers failed to stop the harassment against Barry that eventually led to his death. The lawsuit failed, unfortunately. The Cuddles, they also fought the promotion of a base commander, but again, that too failed. And the commander received his promotion and he was found as having no fault in Barry's death. I think it should be noted that Barry himself never identified as gay. He was a boy that fell for a girl. And that was it. And Calpurnia said she was a girl that fell for a boy. And because of two people and their issues with themselves, a life was taken. And that is the story of Barry Winchell. It's been over 20 years and I still think about it. And I don't, every once in a while, I don't know. It just pops into my head. And, you know, I'm glad we did this because it forced me to kind of look it up again and to see the result. You know, I didn't. I didn't realize I, there were parts of it that everybody knew. And then there were parts that were kind of, yeah. you hear this thing, you hear that thing, you hear this thing, you hear that thing. Not something that, that thing, anyone so. wanted to talk about at that time, I'm sure. And I can't imagine Calpurnia and, you know, I believe she has been, you know, married since, but she's said in interviews, you know, Barry was the love of my life. And it doesn't, you know, sometimes, you, sometimes you can meet someone and you've known each other a week and you're in love. I mean, you hear stories about people who meet and, you know, two months later they're married and they've yeah. been married for 40 years. There's no time no, limit on how long it takes to fall I, in love I with someone. fall in love nearly every day. <laughs> uh, Calpurnia has put on her website as well that if you were touched by the story, you can donate. You can donate to modernmilitary.org. You can donate. And it's a voice. Their website says a united voice for the LGBTQ military and veteran community, our modern military family. So if this is a story that has touched you, that's what Calpurnia has asked that maybe you can donate to that. That's the B side. Oh, it's, it's my turn now. So... The way I was planning on talking about the A-side tonight was to change the moment that you started tonight. From one singular person you mentioned early on in your side. So I am only good in the last... I'll, I'll turn 40 in January, and I have decided or realized that I am only good at four things naturally. Legos. Super good at Legos. Always have been, always will be. Uh, Falling in love on a daily basis. (laughs) Lying and acting. Mm -hmm. And. Oh. Well, yeah, that's where I was going. But they 
don't because most of acting is showing the true part of yourself through someone else. Whereas lying is hiding parts of yourself. And as I was thinking about these four things I'm good at, one, Legos are the best. And if I could ever make a living out of just playing with Legos, I would do so. Uh, but I just recently visited the Lego store at the Mall of America and they're not hiring. So that's not happening anytime soon. Falling in love, not a profession that I would recommend <laughs> for anyone. So my two options are lying or acting. And so I chose acting because it's lying <laughs> in an acceptable way. And one of the things that I have always looked at is like, what are the roles that I would always like to play? Like, what are the things like, Every actor, every person who's ever tried out for a role has dream roles and dream projects that they want to be a part of. And my entire A-side tonight is going to be about Sherlock Holmes because I have always wanted to be Sherlock Holmes. Mm -hmm. But there was a moment in the B-side that reminded me of something that is also on the bucket list. And it's also a bit of a moment where I need to remind myself of how much I've missed and how many things I didn't know because of the privilege that I grew up in. So right before my daughter was born in 2004, I auditioned for a play, which I did virtually every week when I lived in Massachusetts. I was auditioning for something. And I auditioned for a play called The Laramie Project, which was all about the story of Matthew Shepard. This was 2004. The play was written in 2000. The incident happened in the mid-90s. But as a privileged white male, I had never heard of the story of Matthew Shepard until I was auditioning for a role in that play. And it reminds me how important theater could be and can be to expand the understanding of people outside of their experience. Matthew Shepard's story is torturous and horrible and unfair. And we are right around the anniversary of when all this happened in 1998. And I wouldn't have maybe given a second thought, uh, but you mentioned his name in the B-side and how clear it was to me that I had missed this incredibly important life-changing event and cultural event because for me, as a privileged white person in Minnesota, it didn't exist. A yes. Privileged yes. cisgendered yeah. white male in Minnesota. And I didn't even find out about it until six years later when I was auditioning for a theater role, which I was only able to audition for because I was a privileged cisgendered white male. So when I talk about the roles that I wish I had been able to be a part of, I auditioned for this play. I didn't get it. And I probably didn't get it because I had no frame of reference for what the play was about. Cause I'd never heard of this murder, this hate crime before I was auditioning for the role, but it does go down as something that I hope that someday will get to be a part of and something that I hope more people can find out about. It is what are we 1998 to 2020. So 22 years ago. And it was a Tony Award winning play. It was a movie, but it's been buried because it's, it's old now. So I don't know if people have heard of it. So I would encourage anybody who, like myself, didn't know about it to look up the Laramie Project. We are 22 years and a couple of weeks from the actual event. So it's a play I hope I can someday do. Uh, and I couldn't talk about my side, which is about roles that I wish I could play or one role specifically without talking about a role that I wish I could play, but a play I could be a part of because it, it is frustrating to me that I as a 23 year old white male had to audition for a role to find out, to be informed and to learn about this hate crime. When to me, it was just a play I was auditioning for and I didn't even know it was real until I went to the audition. So if you've never, uh, and I know Brooke, you have, but if anybody else has never investigated the Laramie project, please do. Don't be like me who was luckily 
shamefully blind to reality for so long. And hopefully someday I will get to be a part of a production of the Laramie Project. Stepping away from that, my A side this week is all about one of the greatest characters in fiction, in my opinion. And I have been obsessed and fascinated by the character of Sherlock Holmes for most of my life. It goes all the way back to, ironically, not a Sherlock Holmes movie at all. Uh, But in my opinion, the greatest Disney movie, The Great Mouse Detective, which tells the story of Basil, the mouse detective, (laughs) and his accomplice who is a doctor who was in the war it's basically sherlock holmes but in mouse form and he has to fight radigan who is just the world's worst rat uh and he's got this super cool dog named toby who is a basset hound and i love my dog to the moon and back uh but i will someday have a basset hound named toby uh and so for me <laughs> sherlock holmes was this amazing character and something that I always wanted to play. And that kind of came home in the last two weeks because uh, Netflix has a new movie out called Enola Holmes uh, starring and produced by uh, Millie Bobby Brown. And the whole story is about Sherlock Holmes and Mycroft Holmes, little sister Enola. But in that movie, Sherlock Holmes is played by Henry Cavill or Cavill. I don't know how you say his name, but Either way, it could be Cavill, it could be ha- Henry. I'm just going to say think it's Henry, the really handsome dude who plays Superman and also The Witcher. I don't even know if he needs a last name at this point, but <laughs> he's also an actor whose <laughs> entire career has been, for a very long time, a lot of runner-ups. Like, he was in line to play to play Captain America, but Chris Evans beat him out. He was in line to play Batman, but Christian Bale beat him out. So he was always this guy who, like, everyone in Hollywood was like, this guy's going to be a star. He's going to be so good. But, like, mm, just hasn't found the right role yet. And he kept losing roles left and right. And then he ends up getting Superman. And everyone's like, oh, sorry about that. Uh, Because that was not a good movie. Like, he's a great Superman. He was not given a lot to work with. His best roles, in my opinion, have been other movies like, well, one, The Witcher, which is a great series. But uh, the man from Uncle, that should have been way more successful than it was because that was an exceptional script and they're all really, really good. He also went on to do like the bad villain guy in like Mission Impossible. But I think he really found himself in The Witcher because he actually cared about the content. Like he played mm-hmm. the games, he read the books. And so he seems to have found something that he cares about and it could be his thing and maybe make up for the fact that he was cast as Superman and given basically nothing as a script to do, which is not fair. So he plays Sherlock Holmes and Enola Holmes. And I asked myself, like, wow, here's this guy who has been so close to so many epic roles, but he finally gets maybe one of the most sought after and played roles ever as Sherlock Holmes. And then as I do, I started to use the internet and I was like, it was like, okay, I would never be able to play Superman. Don't have the pecs for it. Not good in spandex, but I might be able to play Sherlock Holmes at some day. I was like, who else <laughs> has played Sherlock Holmes? Cause immediately you comes to mind. You're like, you think of the two most recent famous, well-known Sherlock Holmes, Robert Downey Jr. And Benedict Cumberbatch. Both did amazing jobs. Mm -hmm. I was like, okay, but there has to be a lot of other people who have played Sherlock Holmes over the last, I don't know, 100 years. And it is an embarrassingly impressive list of people. And Brooke, I know you will. So I'm starting out with the thing that will connect with you a little bit. So Sherlock Holmes, there have been two actors who played Doctor Who, who also played Sherlock Holmes. Yeah. Matt Smith? Nope. Wait a minute. Older, older. Uh, Capaldi. The most. Oh, okay. Yeah. He would be oh, so good. Oh, also, if you've oh, never never good. watched uh, Neverwhere, uh, find the BBC TV version because he plays the Angel Insulton and he's amazing. Uh, Tom Baker, who was the Doctor Who, yeah, with with the hat and the long scarf, he's like the one oh. everyone played for Halloween. Yeah, he was. 
Yes, well, long multicolored yes. scarf. That's like long multicolored scarf. Yeah, cosplay Doctor Who for Halloween. You're going to use that scarf. It's just so obviously iconic. Yeah, either you're either you're doing the either you're doing the scarf and the hat from right, Tom Baker, right. or you're doing the fez and the bow tie from Matt. So that's the Doctor Who. Combo. Sherlock Holmes was also yeah. played by a James Bond actor, and I know there's like seven at this point, but can you guess which of the James Bond actors might be might have played Sherlock Holmes. Mm, I'm gonna say, is it not? Oh, it's not Connery. Um, what's the uh, not um, not no, George Lazenby, but really that is also the best Sherlock Holmes looking, movie, or I'm sorry, um, the best James Bond movie ever. No, no, not him. Um, 70s. Oh goodness, ruggedly handsome, dark dark hair. No, not so 70s. the guy who it did play like Sherlock 80s, Holmes and 90s. played James Bond was Roger Moore. Also, the worst. Uh, oh, James that Bond makes sense ever. too. Ever, we can we can have an entire episode about that later. But like Timothy Dalton was not good. Pierce like Brosnan is who I was thinking of. Like Pierce Brosnan actually was supposed to play him when Timothy Dalton played him, uh, but they couldn't get him out of his uh, Scarecrow and Mrs. King contract, so he couldn't do it. Yeah, Pierce Brosnan's the stuff. That's the so, show I was trying to think of. Not okay. only did two Doctor Who's and one James Bond play Sherlock Holmes, but you have. Two actors from and an adventure. You had and an adventure. Lord of the Rings. Two Avengers. Two of the main characters in Lord of the Rings have both played Sherlock Holmes. So you've got Christopher Lee, who was uh, Saruman, hmm. and Gandalf himself, Ian McKellen, have both played Sherlock Holmes. Uh, the Grand Moff Tarkin from Star Wars, Peter Cushing, played him two different times, separated by a nine-year period. Milton Berle played him. What? In a, yeah, in a 1949 TV episode. You've got uh, Michael Caine, who is maybe best known to modern audiences as Alfred to Christian Bale's Batman, but also was the, had one of the more incredible, like, action movies of the 70s, where he was just a badass and beating people up that was then later mm -hmm. uh, turned into a... Sylvester Stallone movie called Mr. Carter. Uh, but in the 70s, that was the first time. Like, he was just, he was a bad dude who was, like, mm -hmm. trying to get his money back and beating people up. And that was not not a thing you did in the 70s for an English movie. He played Sherlock Holmes in a send-up of the entire idea so like Sean Holmes was a hired actor and it was all Watson who was doing all of the behind the scenes actual detective work and so Sherlock Holmes is played as sort of like bumbling buffoon uh, and Watson mm -hmm. is the brains behind the whole thing which is then this movie came out in 1987 and then 21 years later they do the same exact thing with Will Ferrell and John C. Riley as Sherlock Holmes and Watson but they're both bumbling and they're just like constantly mm -hmm. messing things up and not doing well uh it was actually one of yeah. the most revered or like reviled movies of 2018 uh it was it won the 39th annual Golden Raspberry Award winner for mm -hmm. the best movie ever made that year it has a Rotten Tomatoes score of 10 percent which is which is hard <laughs> to do because Rotten Tomatoes takes like wow. the public's votes into account so that's how bad this was you had to like the, even the public can't save you like people who love will ferrell and john c Riley can't save that movie so you've got modern leading men as we mentioned we've always got we've already got robert downey jr which his guy richie version uh with oh my goodness who played as watson oh it's uh, it's jude yeah, law kind of, jude law there you go so jude law and robert downey re-established sherlock holmes as a major movie character because there were no movies made about sherlock holmes for like 11 years there were TV shows, there were like like TV movies, but no like actual full on in the theater productions until Guy Ritchie, Robert Downey Jr. and Jew Law decided to make that Sherlock Holmes. So he comes back, they make a ridiculous amount of money. And then you've got both two modern adaptations of Sherlock Holmes that are in the footsteps of that Robert Downey, Jude Law, Guy Ritchie production so you've got Benedict Cumberbatch as this modern who in my opinion mm -hmm. and maybe I'm biased but I think the first three movies of the Cumberbatch version of Sherlock are arguably perfect they are exceptionally well done they do the stories enough they give enough homage to the stories but also change them a little bit enough to make it 
new. And then you've got the elementary series with Johnny Lee Miller Mm -hmm. and Lucy Liu, which takes another entire spin on the Sherlock Holmes, Watson, even uh, Lestrade, like those two happen without the guy Richie. They spin everything. And they do a really good job. There are many people who would say that's not a Sherlock Holmes movie because it's more about the action. But there is enough of an, a mystery there that I still think it connects. But some other famous names that have played Sherlock Holmes. In 1991, in a television broadcast of a stage play, the classic actor Charlton Heston played Sherlock Holmes on a TV broadcast. A John Cleese... Uh, from Monty Python and A Fish Named Wanda, which is a highly underrated movie, played him twice. Uh, Matt Fewer, who that name probably doesn't ring any bells until I tell you that it was literally Max Headroom. Max Headroom. Yeah, yeah. Uh, who played it four times on Canadian TV. Uh, Jonathan Price, who was on Game of Thrones. He played the High Sparrow, and he's won multiple Tony Awards on Broadway. Christopher Plummer, who for... The most of my life, I only knew as the dad from Sound of Music Mm -hmm. because my mother would sing me to sleep, or at least try to, by singing songs from Sound of Music. And it was like one of the few movies that we would watch repeatedly when I was a child. And of course, then there was Will Ferrell, who played him in the 2018 horrible movie that everyone hates, but probably isn't as bad as people think it is it was just poorly well done and it was it took like six years like if it had come out right after the robert downey jr version i think people would have been like oh this is just a spoof but it took six years and like five different writers and it really got off track uh so if you're looking for a a farce sherlock holmes i think you should probably look at the michael Caine version as opposed to the will ferrell so that leads us to my final part which is i I have a notebook that I keep of top fives of everything. And we're talking like top five favorite mixed drinks, top five favorite plays, top five moments I've kissed someone, top five favorite sports experiences I have been a part of or I have seen. Uh, And I have a top five favorite Sherlock Holmes performers. And whether you like it or not, you're going to learn those top five right now. (laughs) So, in the top five Sherlock Holmes performances of all time. Sorry, let me do the voice better. In the top five Sherlock Holmes performances of all time. (laughs) Number five, Michael Caine. Number four, Ian McClellan. Number three, Robert Downey Jr. Number two, Benedict Cumberbatch. And number one is, it all goes full circle, Basil Rathbone. He is the actor who has played Sherlock Holmes the most. And he is the actor who inspired the character named Basil from The Great Mouse Detective. He's played so, him in 12 different looking, movies. Yeah, and two TV series. Wow. And that's why The Great Mouse Detective, who is based off of Sherlock Holmes, and who Basil Rathbone plays the voice of Sherlock Holmes, that's why the main character is named Basil. Because there will never be a better actor to play Sherlock Holmes than Basil Rathbone. So he is my number one. Sherlock Holmes actor of all time. And also, yes, I actually do have this notebook of the top fives and don't ask about it ever again. Uh, you brought it up. It's fair game now. <laughs> there, there's a, there's a lot of media things in there. And there's also a lot of like, nobody needs a top five of their favorite vegetables, but I've got it. Oh boy. <laughs> all right. So if you have not checked out uh, Enola Holmes yet on Netflix. You absolutely should. It's great. So of good. course, of course, Sherlock is not the main star. He's a sidekick in this one, but um, Millie Bobby Brown does a great job, and so does Henry. And then um, Sam Claflin, yeah, who plays My- Mycroft, yeah. does a really good job. Who was uh, 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 I volunteer's tribute? Hunger Games. Yeah, yeah, he was. Well, yeah, he was like the super pretty boy from Hunger yes. Games. Yes. Yeah, the yes. guy who who won and then comes back as like a teacher and then gets... Yeah, Hunger Games and um, Catching Fire. He was Finnick O'Dare. Finnick O'Dare, yeah. That's a and, great uh, name. Finnick, yes. yes. And he was also in... I didn't realize he was in Peaky Blinders, but Adrift, which is a really, really sweet movie. Like, it's sad but and heartbreaking, but beautiful. Uh, he was also in Me Before You, which is based on a true story, which will catch you in your throat and you'll just be sobbing like a oh, baby. 
yeah, that that one that one is one of those. Okay, halfway through, I'm gonna need to get a new box of tissues. Yeah. Oh yeah, it's a good one. And I I think I, I after watching him in Hunger Games, I was like, oh, he's a cocky sob. And then I saw him in Me Before You, and I was like, I love him. Oh my gosh. So. Yeah, and then in Enola Holmes, he plays Mycroft, which is the like there there is virtually no re- unredeeming character within the Sherlock Holmes pantheon but if there is one it might be Mycroft yeah because he's the personification of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's hate for the government so is that your a song that's the a side so watch Enola Holmes and also if you have never heard of the Laramie Project look it up yes watch 100%. it it's not gonna be easy maybe maybe partner of the two watch the Laramie Project and learn and feel it and then use Enola Holmes as the chaser to kind of get you back to equilibrium. But mm-hmm. the learning project is important. And I'm embarrassed that I didn't know about it until I auditioned for it. And I'm embarrassed that it's not as well known as it should be now, 20 years later, because it, it changed things, the project, mm-hmm. the moment. Uh, and there are a lot of things that it changed that we still need to protect. Well, it has been another episode of a side b side we have a brand new website which i don't even know if you've looked at yet adam i have it looks amazing because i don't understand websites or coding but i do understand that i am blessed with having a partner who can make this stuff work which (laughs) if without brooks talents i don't know if we'd have a website uh i'm really good at myspace and geocities so (laughs) oh gosh uh, so we would probably be like a side b side at dot myspace slash geocities or <laughs> the other way around so i'm very very thankful that we have the opportunity uh to have all these cool things and thank you brooke for that you're very welcome my pleasure you can check out our new website at a side b side podcast dot square dot site and we've got all of our merch over there as well so you can check it out my mom is like got a couple of t-shirts and she's like i love these things i was like i know they're so comfortable right and so yeah i'm probably gonna order another one and walk around with a you know our logo which happens to have a knife in it on my sweatshirt but i don't care because it's comfortable so yeah And, and we do have a shower curtain which i have held off buying because i hope to have visitors someday in my apartment uh, but <laughs> <laughs> if you have a spare bedroom or a spare bathroom <laughs> and you need a shower curtain i highly recommend it all right adam thanks thank you thank you for joining us for another episode of a side b side podcast we really hope you enjoyed the episode and if you did we'd appreciate it if you'd head on over to apple and leave us a rating or a review and make sure you come back next friday for another episode